Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NITSI Transportation Seminar Series. Uh, I'm very happy to here to welcome uh, Professor Aaron Golub, who's a faculty here at uh, Portland State University. Uh, Aaron joined us from Arizona State University this fall, and his uh, research and teaching interests are uh, sustainable urban transportation planning and public transportation issues. Am I being picked up okay? Okay. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's, it's been a fun quarter getting to know PSU and I'm excited this is my first lecture here in my new position. Uh, and thank I see some of my colleagues in the audience so I'm really excited about that. I just want to spend a little bit of time kind of setting up this project. It's a new project for me. I actually have never presented any work from this project, so it'll be not the smoothest, so forgive me. I've worked, so next year will mark 20 years of, of my working in this, in what you would call the transportation justice space around analyzing plans and policies for their distributive effects, who wins, who loses, who's involved in planning. And um, two really recently, the idea of bicycles and bicycle access has never really been a strong or, or prominent um, idea within the transportation justice space. But a lot of things are happening over the last few years that kind of is raising this issue. Um, I'm on, for example, I'm on a transportation research board environmental justice committee, and if you mention bicycles in that committee, they laugh. It's not considered part of the suite of solutions to transportation justice issues. And I, I, I don't like answers that are absolutely zero, nothing, there's no relationship. There must be some relationship because, of course, it makes up part of the transportation network. We're seeing increasing ridership in many corridors in the United States, and we're seeing uh, increased uh, resources and public um, effort going towards improving the, the bicycle transportation system. So there must be some relationship between transportation justice broadly practiced and the more specific issue of bicycle justice or bicycle transportation as I'll, as I'll talk about this. So that's where this project originated, but it really was pushed forward in my schedule because I was asked to edit a book on bicycle justice um, following up on the Incomplete Streets book which looked at more broadly transportation justice within the complete streets paradigm which some of you might have seen. And um, I was approached by the editors and I, I had, don't do research on bicycles but I have a long history of doing work in the transportation justice space and they thought I would be good and I, I of course um, sought other editors to help me because this is not exactly my expertise. So Melody Hoffman, uh, uh, Donia Lugo, and Gerardo Sandoval, who's down at U of O, all work more closely to these issues of non-motorized transportation uh, and, and equity. Um, still, I was uneasy. We got all these chapter submissions, and they're great case studies on community-oriented bicycle planning and all these alternative planning approaches and, and, and equity in, in bicycle planning. There's a lot of things happening. But I wasn't, I was still uneasy about this relationship between the bigger transportation justice paradigm, which is rests on the Civil Rights Act, and on a long history of lineage from the civil rights movement, and this connection to bicycle planning. So my basic research question here, and I'm turning this into a chapter in this book that we're producing, is how does bicycle justice play into the concerns of the larger transportation justice movement? What are the synergies between them and what are the conflicts? So I'm going to actually spend a bit of time reviewing these concepts of transportation justice, justice, civil rights, things I've I've mentioned, um, clarify these research questions. Then I'm going to actually show a, a quick case of some work we did in the Phoenix area, which um, kind of shows the disparity even within the bicycle justice realm as effort is made and resources are placed into bicycle planning, how that 
can play out uh, differently in different communities. Then I'll return and focus on uh, bicycle justice in its actual practice um, outside of the infrastructure analysis that we did in the case study. And then I'll return to uh, these research questions. I'm basically combining data and, and thought and literature from human geography, from sociology, from urban history, and from transportation planning and engineering uh, in this study. I only have one slide with numbers, so sorry. Actually, two, but they're the same slide. So bicycle justice is a legitimate concept. So I'm using this idea of that, that bicycle activists have, have kind of, and I don't think they use this term, but this, this effort to, to, to regain street space in what, what should be public spaces, although they've been privatized, um, as an effort of justice. It's, it's against a kind of long tide of, of using street space for private vehicles. So I'll call that bicycle justice. I don't think that bicycle activists call it this. I was actually on the board of a, of a bike coalition for four years, and I don't think we talked about it in this way, but I think it's easier because it is a kind of a justice frame. They're trying to get something that they feel they deserve. That's a justice frame, so I'm just going to refer to it as bicycle justice for the rest of this talk. So, um, and this is what really the, this movement is trying to get at, that, that streets were public spaces for most of their history. For the last 5,000 years of streets, they were public spaces with mixed uses and informal access that was not as regulated as when we privatized the streets, this is Market Street in San Francisco in the 1880s, and when we privatized the streets into making them only for users of private vehicles, mostly, that change, that was an injustice to the bicycle movement. Uh, one irony is that the bicycle movement really in the 1870s, 80s, 90s created the idea of regulating streets for movement and improving streets. The Good, good Roads movement in the late 1800s created the impetus for this eventual complete privatization. On the other hand, I'm going to use this term transportation justice as a pretty well-defined term. Um, it's a movement in the lineage of the civil rights movement that seeks to uh, address long-standing injustices in the transportation planning process, be it who's at the table, who's represented during policy and planning, and who bears the burdens of infrastructure, that is, where the infrastructure is placed, where the nuisances of infrastructure, be it highway through neighborhoods, bus depots in neighborhoods, and other nuisances, and the benefits of investments in service and in infrastructure. Those things have been shown, and if I can, um, I'm not going to use any evidence here, to create great disparities between neighborhoods, uh, especially on the dimensions of race and class. So let's just get a couple things out of the way before we move on into um, some more, more complex uh, issues. Um, so the right to bicycle is a low hurdle to get over. Um, bicycles are recognized as vehicles in the street. So the idea of bicycle justice is, is not really necessary. You have the right to use a bicycle on any public road. Some limited access freeways are prohibited. Some cities in the United States have banned the use of bicycles, but they're extremely rare. Um, generally, bicycles have the responsibility of any vehicle. All of these codes were written in the 1880s and 1890s, and then there was a national traffic code in the early 1920s that made this fairly uniform. So that's not that interesting. As well, uh, the right to mobility, this, the U.S. Constitution, case law has shown that people have the right to move about in whatever way they want. Um, it's not always respected in different states. In the U.S., it, it is. It's also uh, a part of the U.N. Declaration on Human Rights. So this idea of moving around and being on a bicycle is not that controversial. Where it gets interesting is when we actually look at the social context of how rights are, are promoted, 
become understood widely, whether legal or, or informal, and then enforced by, by, by communities. I realize I can use this. Sorry. So this comes into the idea of citizenship. Now, I don't mean legal citizenship. I mean those who are informally or formally deemed citizens have often greater access to these rights. They, their rights are, are preserved better, and they may actually have more um, say in, in, in changing policies and plans, as we'll discuss. So civil rights is a framework um, preserved in the U.S. Constitution, um, um, renovated uh, after the Civil War to include blacks and other minorities. And then um, some of the issues that arose after the Civil War in, in the separate but equal doctrine in the late 1800s was then erased with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, the Civil Rights Act, which tries to address long-standing separate but equal, which were really separate but unequal treatments, um, actually have regulations and guidance as it pertains to transportation projects, so plans, infrastructure, projects. Um, you can look at, um, there's a host of guidance for FDA, federal highways, MPOs, metropolitan planning organizations, long-range plans, infrastructure, smaller infrastructure projects have to meet certain guidelines in terms of who they involve in the planning and ensure that the effects, any burdens, are not disproportional based on race, national origin, uh, language, and other dimensions. Um, so it's interesting that, that uh, sub-recipients of DOT programs, those are cities, uh, MPOs, states, are governed by the Civil Rights Act, and they do manage bicycle infrastructure. So there is this potential link that I'll talk about later between formal civil rights requirements and bicycle access. So it could be that there is this overlap. But, but we need to f get more fundamental in a way in this idea of citizenship because the Civil Rights Act was created to address what became a dual citizenship in the United States between those who were deemed as second-class citizens receiving separate and unequal treatment and those who were deemed full citizens. That, that for some reason the 13th and 14th Amendment was just not enough uh, to, to do that. Um, so what happens even to today is that you, there is still issues of shadow citizens, citizens who are citizens, whether we wanted, I don't want to get into the legal definition, but who don't actually have full treatment equal to their citizen neighbors. Um, this even pertains to certain kinds of movements within a city. Some are seen as more legitimate, more important for planning, especially commute type trips or into CBDs, into, into central di business district, whereas other kinds of trips are often discounted, not planned for, not counted even within um, formal, say, bicycle counts. And that creates this kind of shadow travel. And some people refer to these as invisible cyclists. Um, so this becomes also important. So this, this gets, I think, to this idea of varying citizenship varying abilities on the part of different people to be recognized as um, deservers of rights, if that makes sense. And that, I think, also pertains to the transportation realm. Now, the Civil Rights Act was, was passed specifically to address this issue. And in fact, only minorities are, are protected under the Civil Rights Act. So they have this tool. Um, to possibly try to address some of these shadow issues. And you will hear civil rights brought up um, when, you, when you hear about disparate treatment in the news even today. So let me get back to these core research questions. Is bicycle justice, this, acts, this fight for access to this public realm of the street, a legitimate concern of the broader transportation justice uh, movement. Where do these two frames synergize and where do they conflict? So you could kind of think, and I've, I'm still um, tossing this kind of 
diagram in my, my head. Um, you have a broad human rights bundle of things that we talk about, the right to movement, the right to bodily protection. Um, these are in the UN Declaration and other, other documents. Then we have within that a subset is the right to mo mobility, to move about, and it's protected within the US through the Constitution. And transportation justice is a project within that that focuses on public provision of services, of infrastructure, of plans. And so the question is, where does bicycle justice sit? It, it clearly is a sub-project of the right to mobility. It's a sub-project, in a way, of the right to the city movement, of the right to public spaces. Where does it overlap with the, this, this somewhat well-defined transportation justice movement? So I'm going to introduce another concept. Um, objectives of justice struggles normally or generally reflect an ob this object is something that society is really concerned about, that where it has an importance that justifies great effort on the part of the society to distribute in some way. This is something that justice scholars call the social meaning of something. And in a way, the social meaning is a litmus test for how much effort we put into it. You could, if an alien dropped from another planet and looked around at, at the kind of efforts we put into distributing something, they would say those are the important things in this society. Whether or not we recognize that openly or, or speak about it formally, it's still it's this result of our effort. Let me, let me explain a little bit. So we use um, kind of two dimensions here. The degree of this social meaning and the, the public concern over its provision. And generally, things run along this axis, this positive, uh, sorry, this positive dimension here movement along these two axes, where uh, low social meaning, high social meaning is on that axis. Um, and the public concern over its provision, if there's low concern over the provision of something, we'll let the market do it, because those with the ability to pay will do it, get it, and then others won't, and we won't be that concerned. So on the other hand, if we're very concerned about something, we will make great effort in the public realm to collect resources and redistribute them to provide for this good. Let me use some examples. So luxury type goods typically have low concern by the public for their distribution. And they don't have a very strong public meaning. They may have a strong private meaning. Let's say within my family, I have an heirloom piece of jewelry. I am concerned about it. But my ability to buy jewelry is not a public concern. Jewelry isn't subsidized. Of course, I have consumer protections against fraud, but those are provided in a variety of ways. And fraud is a public concern. Um, on the other hand, our big public concerns are things that we actually put resources and effort into, things like shelter, education, food, health care. I put a question mark. It's slowly moving from market and low concern in the US up to where it probably should be normatively as a big public concern where we do uh, worry about its distribution by placing it in the public concern. Um, education is free and compulsory for everyone. It has been since the late 1800s. We put a lot of effort into making sure that ed education is accessible. We don't ask anyone's citizenship status. It is immediately, if you arrive from another planet, your child is immediately enrolled in school without question. It's that important. And transportation, I would argue, does sit up here, we, we all pay several hundred dollars a year into your local tax system for TriMet, for the roads, whether or not you know it, through your um, property taxes, your income taxes, that's all paying into these uh, tax packages. If you drive, you're paying gasoline tax, those are collected. So this is something that actually we put a lot of effort into. It also belongs in this corner. The question here then, if we're going to say that bicycle justice is this object of struggle, has it moved out of this realm of being a, a toy 
to and using the margins of public infrastructure where there really doesn't need to be a great public effort to do that, has it moved into an area of public concern? And I'm not sure that it has. In some corridors of some cities, it may have. But I think broadly, I, I still i am not sure where we've arrived. Now, of course, bicycle activists are doing a great deal to move this idea into one of great importance, but I don't know that we're there yet. But this didn't stop me. Um, I wanted to, um, and it hasn't stopped activists. So if you look at the, mo the bicycle justice movement, um, we're really on the fourth wave of a, of a pro-cycling movement in the US, the 1880s, World War II, the 70s, which was stopped. In Europe, the 70s kept going to the current, and ours stopped, which is, explains a lot of the difference. And now we're in this 1990s to present movement. Um, we've also seen a, a shift in public policy around finance, where the, the former highway-only transportation bills from 1956 to the late 80s were purely for roads. In 1991, Ice-T um, liberalized that into other modes, so they included provisions for, for paying for bicycle infrastructure through the Highway Trust Fund, through programs like uh, congestion management and air quality and transportation enhancements and others. And that is on top of a growth in local spending on bicycle infrastructure. And, and in fact, in some cities, we've seen an explosion of use. In some corridors, it really bicycles dominate. You can find some of those corridors even within Portland and other cities. Yet the movement, bicycle justice, even as it's growing in, in importance somewhat, is still concerned about its, its optics of equity. So you'll see a lot of reports about bicycle justice uh, and equity, trying to, to address some of the racial issues. It's fair, the, the advocacy world is fairly white and middle class. And so they know it's a concern. It, it, and it, it, it you know, was interest to me, hence this, this chapter. So let me get back to bicycle justice. Um, so bicycle justice, besides being this movement for infrastructure, has to contend with the social context in which it operates. And this is where I will get more into this synergy and tension between transportation justice. Um, it's situated within a complex socio-technical system with, with planning paradigms, with um, social norms, with individual resources and their abilities to use this system, as well as the infrastructure. I'm going to show a case study in Phoenix where, where we really show how bicycle justice, while it looks great, is still metered by the social geography of who lives where and who is going where. Where even when you've achieved a degree of bicycle justice, you see some of the barriers. So this is a bike connectivity study we did in Phoenix uh, with a colleague, Mike Kuby, in the School of Geography. These are the research assistants, Matt Messina and Sean Monk. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly diverge onto this, but I think it's an interesting example. So this is the bike network in Phoenix. It's not as, as bad as many of you might suspect. There's been a great deal of investment since the mid-90s, much like the rest of the United States, in bicycle lanes, in some exclusive bicycle facilities. They're also blessed with an incredible canal system where they have used the canal paths as exclusive bikeways which do really great inter-neighborhood connections. There are some bike and pad only bridges. There's a lot of good infrastructure. They have uh, Tempe, where I lived, has a decent bike mode share to work in the 5 6%, which puts it definitely among the highest of the small cities in the United States. So one, and, and you see the distribution is fairly good. And one would think that, and, and the bike activists are, are fairly active there and they have achieved a degree of bicycle justice, we measured the quality of that connectivity. And I'm not going to get into the technical issues here, but and sorry, the screen is not perfect but um, with the, res with the um, contrast. But the lighter colors, the greens, I was told to use the mouse. Um, the greens on these areas are the very well-connected areas where one taking a bicycle 
would be able to go on a fairly safe route in a very direct way to reach their destination. The red areas where, are where one would have to deviate quite substantially to, to remain on a safe route to get to their destination. So it's what we call a route directedness index. It's really comparing that bicycle prefer, preferred path to the shortest path. If they're the same, it gets a very good score. If they're very different, then it's considered low connectivity. So you can see there's investment, of course, in this corridor in central Phoenix, around Arizona State University and Tempe, in areas of Scottsdale and in West Phoenix into the downtown. But then we have to look as the transportation frame, we would then look at the social geography of the region. And the region is, like most regions in the United States, extremely segregated. This is the white population of Phoenix. And I'll just go through a series of maps. This is the Hispanic population. These are census data showing the percent of each of these, uh, I think they're census blocks. In areas we're using census tracts, census blocks, we, we had a kind of intermingling. Um, black population, which was f formally and informally confined to below the river until the civil rights movement. And there's some movement, but relatively little. Uh, and this is uh, households in poverty, which again shows this, this bias towards the west side of Phoenix. So what I did is I just did a population-weighted average route directedness index, this quality of the bicycle infrastructure, by population, and compared them. Um, so when we look at, at, at the quality of the infrastructure from black African-American households, it's significantly lower. Let me um, I have this slide. These are the two slides with numbers. Um, if we took, we had different destination types because the route directness index depends on what kind of destinations you're getting to. We did a bunch of different kinds, schools, job centers, transit stations, high schools, uh, other, uh, other things, shopping districts. Um, we also, this is just the data pulled out only for the employment centers and for the light rail stations. You can see for the black and African American households, there's a significant difference between their RDI and the average for the entire group. Similarly with the households in poverty, which are more on the west side, uh, Hispanic households. White households were fairly around the mean, except in general they were a bit three standard errors higher, which is, puts them in, a, you know, in the 99th percentile, 99% uh, sure that they are a different group. Bike commuters, when we looked at um, where those folks live, they had very good access, which of course is this chicken and egg. Some of the planning may have followed where the bike commuters are, and some people realize they can bike commute when the infrastructure is very good. So that's all I have for that case. I want to show that although bicycle justice in, in a way was achieved there, if you look at the infrastructure and the investments that Phoenix has made, when you actually look at the social geography, you can see there's some uncomfortable differences that remain. So there is the, this difference here between the two frames. Now, it's not that bicycle planners are not eager to fix those things. And in fact, as a bicycle planner, you could probably look at the network and quickly address some of the disparities um, fairly quickly. So let me get back to investigating this bicycle justice frame. And then I'll, I'll conclude. So I'm going to look at the socio-technical um, setting of the bicycle justice, the planning practices, the social norms, the infrastructure, and the personal resources that people have to even use this system. If it's one of broad justice claims, it should be something that, that many people have access to. The planning practice, unfortunately, is a problematic from a transportation justice framework. It has not followed a lot of the goals and paradigms of transportation justice. Um, interestingly, well, not surprisingly, it, it prioritizes commuters over non-commuters. 
especially CBD oriented commuters in a kind of this radial format which disregards these peripheral commuters or people working on their bike for delivery and these shadow cyclists as I said before. Um, it tends to respond to vocal communities and vocal communities tend to be white and middle class. That's just how planning works in the United States. Again, reinforcing this dual citizenship. Um, and, and getting a little bit back into these two, there's a long history of, of white supremacy within bicycle um, narratives, especially in the late 1800s, where bicycling was seen to be an activity that whites should do to become stronger and in a way propagate the master race. This was actually, if you look at the history of bike, of the bike movement, this was very prominent. Of course, we don't see that recently, but the continuation of the heavily white middle class leadership among the bike justice movement, I'm not saying it's, it's the same, but it, it's not it's, it, they're not doing a lot to try and remove that stigma from the earlier waves. Um, of course, there's this badly, uh, it's, I don't want to rest too much on this, but the League of American Bicyclists for a long time had an exclusionary clause prevent, um, preventing blacks from being members. And it wasn't until 1999 that they formally removed that, although they didn't have in de facto a restriction on black membership for most of their history, but they had that on the books uh, and they didn't remove it formally until 1999. Another issue with the planning process for bicycles, it's been associated through some studies that it, that it accompanies real estate speculation and, and neighborhood change, gentrification and displacement. Either accompanying it predicting it or following, but either way, it, it, it has been shown, especially in the New York area, to be integrated with that process. And finally, again, getting back to this invisible cyclist, the data that often exists for cycling exists for these, the ones that planning most favors, these CBD commuters, and less often these outer borough, to use New York speak, or you know, peripheral commuters, ones making maybe work trips on their bike, doing food delivery or things like that. So there is this planning disparity. Um, again, going back to the, so, uh, moving on to the social norms. Um, what's interesting is cycling only in the 1880s was seen as aspirational for broad, broadly for the nation, so to speak meaning it was actually something that people celebrated broadly. Now it's clearly a second class mode. Uh, you, you will find some people, a few percent of the population who actively celebrate bicycles. It is not broadly celebrated within the norms of what's held up as successful uh, you know, first class travel. Some people prop it up obviously for its environmental reasons, socially responsible, all these other things, yes. But those are not, one could hardly call those dominant norms in the United States. They're very peripheral. They may not be peripheral in, in Portland, but they are to the rest of the country. Sorry, I have to look at my slides. Um, right, so, so the recent wave, as I said before, has not been very racially or class open. It's been very white middle class, professional. Um, there are some isolated cases of community-based uh, bicycle organizations, shops, rides. Those are great. We're including those in our book, and they're very inspirational. But they are not the dominant norm within the cycling community. The counterpoint to these normative issues is that actually census data shows that bicycling among minorities and low income is very high. It's actually higher than for whites. So or similar to whites in some areas. So bucking all those norms is this reality that actually a lot of people are doing this. When we look at the infrastructure, um, it's been shown that infrastructure investments do encourage cycling, and they have co-benefits for pedestrians. Uh, and probably for other goals in the city, uh, reducing traffic, slowing down traffic, reducing fatalities and injuries. So that's interesting. 
Um, unfortunately, bikes impact a very small number of corridors in the United States. It has not become a mass mode. Um, the, the, the cities that have the highest bike mode share, you're talking about 10 to 15 percent of commute trips, maybe less of all trips. Well, actually, maybe more of all trips, but um, it's, it's, it's a very small number. And those are only a f handful of cities. When you go down out of the top, say, five cities, you're still talking in the single digits. So the infrastructure investments have not quite borne fruit, but they, they probably will. The trends are pretty rapid in terms of growth of cycling. Um, ICE-T, again, introduced the systema systematic funding for bicycle infrastructure. So that's a real plus for bicycle justice within this, uh, within this infrastructure framing. Um, but as I said before, there's this pattern of infrastructure cohabitating with issues of displacement and, and gentrification in, in areas of cities. But a final issue about infrastructure, which is really important in getting and in, in kind of bringing in the transportation justice frame and a broader human rights frame, is that streets and public spaces have been shown today and over the last 400 years to be uh, spaces of, of threat and danger to communities of color. And that shouldn't surprise anyone here with all the news. So the focus on bicycle infrastructure has to also recognize that placing oneself in public infrastructure to some communities is not a safe way to go, if that makes sense. And we'll get back to that. Finally, in the personal resources of this, of this broad bicycle justice, um, socio-technical system. Um, bicycles are cheap. They could afford cheap commuting for a lot of people. They, there's no doubt, and they are faster in many corridors than alternatives. And they, with traffic congestion and slow buses and other things, the bike is often the best way to go. So they clearly offer, for those who can do it, this pretty profound personal transformation um, from if they are able to use the bicycle. Of course, physical demands of using a bicycle means that a good share of the population can't. Um, I talked to a civil rights lawyer, and he didn't feel that that precluded the bicycle to be completely excluded from a transportation justice framing. He thought that there are other things. People, some people can't drive, yet driving is very much a, a part of, of the transportation justice frame, the ability to secure an automobile is very much a concern of transportation justice. So he didn't feel that that was a big issue. Of course, there are ADA concerns. So as we have public bike share, the ability for everyone to use the bike share will become a concern. Also, I think there could be ways that agencies kind of get out of the ADA requirements for bike share, but it's not clear right now. But again, in terms of personal resources, some people placing their bodies in public spaces is a, is a threat to them. And then, of course, who has time and resources to participate in the planning of these systems? Again, socio-technical systems have all of these forces on them, and bicycle planning has this requirement that people engage. And not everyone can do that. So that's actually a big issue of the transportation justice movement. So let me just conclude. What are the synergies that I found? Um, Clearly, bikes are part of public infrastructure. And therefore, they are governed by civil rights law. Therefore, I think they should be a concern of the transportation justice movement. I, I don't know of any formal complaints on the part of any communities under the Civil Rights Act against any MPOs or cities around bicycle access. There may be. I don't, I've never heard of any. And I've worked in this field for some time and through the Transportation Research Board, Environmental Justice Committee. I haven't heard of any complaints. They're mostly around bus fare, changes in bus service, regional plans, public involvement processes, language issues around public involvement. Those are the common sets of issues in the transportation justice realm. I have not heard of bicycle access or bicycle infrastructure to be part of that. They're not saying that it couldn't be. Um, I think bi bicycles belong or synergize with the transportation justice frame because they do lower transportation costs. Households that have to own an automobile spend a good share of their income on automobiles. 
depreciating them, maintaining them, fueling them. It's a good, it's been shown to be 10 to 20 percent of their budget or higher. Whereas those who can somehow maintain their household without an automobile, their spending on transportation goes way down in the low single digits. So if they can somehow use a bicycle with a bus pass, this would be a pretty good uh, way to, for households to save, and of course that allows them to spend money on other things. And of course, as I said, bicycles offer a higher level of service in certain corridors. So it, it, I think it should be something that the justice community looks at. The social status of cycling is rising, and that I think then the community should really be looking at it as an object of justice since it's becoming more um, nationally uh, upheld as something important. And this, this phenomenon of the invisible cyclist is actually showing us there's a gr great latent interest, this unmeasured interest in cycling among communities that aren't even involved in planning and aren't even counted, that, that hasn't deterred them from using the bicycle. So that, that's an interesting, I think, data point. But there are some conflicts. Um, this variation in citizenship means that some won't necessarily feel empowered to engage in the planning system. They feel intimidated by being in public space because their civil rights, as we've seen recently, are often threatened by being in public spaces. Um, and that, that dual citizenship in some ways mirrors the lower status of the bicycle. And so I ask in a way that Paul Gilroy, if you're all interested in, the, in some of this anthropology of, of Mobility, Paul Gilroy has an amazing essay called Driving While Black. And there he, he says that as, as harmful as the car has been to the black community, freeways and neighborhoods, suburbanizing jobs, you know, combined with redlining, with discrimination in housing, employment, and, and lending, that still the automobile is seen as this aspirational object because it signifies the symbol of, of first class citizenship. So as, as the bicycle is still second class, it's interesting to think about what are the dynamics around citizenship vis-a-vis -vis this, this second class symbol. Will it be as important as the automobile? Um, placing body in harm's way, as I've said several times, is a conflict. It, it, getting on a bus or driving, of course, we, we know that traffic stops, we've been hearing about this, those are not safe places either. But one would think that being on a bicycle would be even, even perhaps less safe. Um, and of course, that's really the current human rights discourse in the U.S. The Black Lives Matter movement is addressing, is bringing up this issue really. And I think planning has to recognize that these are key issues around public space planning um, for the next foreseeable future. Another conflict is that bike infrastructure is, is associated with displacement and gentrification against the exact communities that are the claimants of transportation justice. So this is a little twist that I think is ironic. Can bicycle planning make investments in areas that don't have great real estate cachet or aren't on the edge of flipping and, and actually create durable investments for communities that will probably remain in place? That's the big question. And I've seen that's happened. Um, it's, not a, it's not impossible. And finally, a big conflict is the white middle class uh, advocacy apparatus within bicycle justice that seems impenetrable. Um, but of course, it's creating shadow advocates, as we're going to profile in our book, and bringing forth all these missing voices. And I think over time, we'll see slowly, the, I think, the congealing of these two movements, um, although it, it's going to be an uneasy period. So this is where I end. Um, if anyone's interested, I can get you. These are some of the references I've been using. This is a lot of mobility anthropology, uh, bike, bike history, transportation justice. So I'll take some questions. I think I have some time left. Yeah. Uh, Michael Flynn, civil engineering. I think, do you have to? Uh, uh, you don't need to. Okay, cool, cool. Um, whenever I read uh, an article in the newspaper online, the comment section is always full of, of people who seem to think that bicycles need registration and insurance and where to pay some sort of road tax uh, in order to get equal status on the roads. Right. Do you feel that that's necessary or an impediment to 
social justice or the bicycle as a mode for social justice? I haven't thought about that. So I don't want to say. Um, you know, we're over surveilled, so I wouldn't want to add another layer of bureaucracy on top of the questionable ones we already have. Um, so I would say no. Those often add barriers to language, to the ability to get some of these documents. We're seeing that movement in the voting space, which is clearly an affront to democracy. So I would say probably not. Um, there is, of course, this tension around rule breaking. So all drivers break the rules all the time they drive. They're the worst offenders on the road. Of course, they, bicyclists do it too, because why not? Everyone else is, right? So I think there is this issue around who is the better citizen. And that is unfortunate. I don't know how to solve that either. There's probably better education for drivers. As more drivers bicycle, they'll understand that there are these dilemmas of stopping at stop signs at the bottom of a hill and no one's coming. Why not just cruise through it? It's obviously it's more threatening to the bicyclist than it is anyone else, whereas when a driver breaks the law, it's very threatening to other people. So I think there's going to be some time where we figure out the good citizen in the road issue. But I think documentation would get, take that too far. Yeah? How is, how is bicycle justice different than skateboard justice? Like, I really like having my own bike lane, and I get really annoyed when there's a skateboarder in it. But I have friends who are really into skateboard justice, right. where I think they belong on the sidewalk. Kind of cool. So am I, am I being like a car, like I won't share my space? Or do I take my right as a, as, a, as a bicyclist and say, this is my lane, I advocated for it, this is my face. And I'm David Werner with Civil Engineering. It's a good Sorry. question. There are always, you know, yesterday's winners want to then become incumbents and prevent others. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Soon you'll have like a little skateboard lane <laughs> next to the bike lane. Is, is that equality, like separate but equal? <laughs> uh, I mean, hopefully the bike infrastructure is good enough to handle everyone, right? All the non-motorized modes. And you'll see in the best infrastructure it is. You know, um, spring water corridor, that's going to handle a lot of people in, in most places. So I don't know how to answer that. I don't want to <laughs> cause a, a scuffle between the skateboarders and the bicyclists. Yeah? Um, Naomi at the Urban Studies of Planning. Uh, well, you give me so much to think about. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't want to do like the mini speech thing where you pretend to have a question, but you instead just give a speech. Because <laughs> yeah. that's bad behavior. But uh, as I hear you talk, I mean, you can respond to this. I'm going to say something, and maybe you can just help me with it. Um, I think about, uh, I love that you use in the anthropology of mobility literature. I think about, and this is like very Marxist, but labor and wealth and the state. Because what you're describing are like people who cycle trips don't count as labor in the eyes of the legitimate labor market for any number of reasons. And then you're also talking about people who think that their claims on the state have not been, who know that their claims on the state have not been legitimate for a really long time. So they, they if they ever were going to engage in this planning process, it's not going to happen now. Because, if, because when you make claims on the state, yeah. it's not going to happen, right? Or like people whose claims on the economy are not legitimate because the black household holds one-fifth of the wealth of the average white household in the United States. And so I think like over and over of these examples of people who don't count or, or don't belong. And so but I think like, that the transportation justice movement has, has actually closed a little bit of the gap around involvement. So you said that they're not making claims on the state. Yet um, I think the best cases of regional plans have been really influenced by the transportation justice movement. Um, you can see in the Bay Area in LA a big influence of claims by civil rights activists on those plans with an effect. Um, you can see programs in federal highway uh, and, and transit reverse commuting. Um, ADA obviously was a huge success, although they felt like they were ignored for decades. They've now been very successful. So I think there are, are evidence of people kind of rising above. Of, well, the cyclists, I think, is this. Yes, they, they, have not, they have not coalesced as a movement. They're on the edge of this bicycle justice. They, they don't see themselves in the transportation justice framing. Mm -hmm. per, perhaps because of the, I, I, before you came in, I was the transportation justice frame has largely laughed at bicycles. For they, they, 
I can bring it up in the meetings I'm in and they'll laugh at it. They, they will literally, and people actually will get angry about it because of some of the gentrification issues and some of the white middle class advocacy. So yeah, there is this place where this invisible cyclist needs to get organized and we're going to profile, so I also, this is part of a book project where we are profiling the invisible cyclist movement in a way to get that. But your comments about the value of certain trips is clearly spot on. The creative class and professionals coming into downtowns need their toys and their things so they're safe and delivery people and people in the outer boroughs don't need that. They're going to, you know, they're not making those trips. So they're, they've been less provided for. But they're waking, wake, waking up. Yeah. I wouldn't be as, as, you know, sad as you are. In the back <laughs> and in the front. Yeah. The reality is that planning departments, machinery departments are all overworked. And it's hard enough to get in, in a meeting when you work for a developer who has millions of dollars and build projects that are going to, you know, add value to the city or whatever community is. As you're doing your research, do you come up with any ideas for people who will be working in that position someday to become more accessible and to create time and carve out for the communities who you, I thought you were speaking on the slide that said that one of the barriers for advocacy is that if you're commuting on your bike, you have to use e-pod a lot of extra time. So, yes, so on that? Um, Improving the public involvement process is generally what you're referring to. Um, there is a lot of effort. So the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. Um, 50 years have gone by. And um, FTA just last year commissioned a study on how to improve. After 50 years, they're still not doing it right. They still have the exact issues you're talking about. People aren't showing up. They don't have time. So there are creative ways of doing it. it it's, it's an imperfect process because people have to have the time or the energy and, the, and somewhat of a technical knowledge about the issues they're, they're chiming in on and they're getting involved in. So it's, there's no easy answer to it. Um, there's no app or anything that can do it, although they try to make apps to do that. Um, so yeah, I would, I would urge you to look into some of those best practices around involving diverse communities in, in project planning. Um, you know, a private developer will rely on guidance from the city, and they, they're not going to do anything more than they need to. Um, so if you're on the city side, you will try to push that process as best you can, you know, and there'll be a little bit of a struggle around that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's not an easy answer to that. But there are, you can take a class in public involvement in the planning school here, and, and Marissa Sabata will talk about, uh, you know, really progressive ways of getting a broader involvement. Yeah. Um, Daryl Napaldi, uh, civil engineering. Um, I'm a student here. I uh, recently co-founded a new bike advocacy group at PSU. It's called Bike PSU. Cool. And a lot of the people who have been coming to the meetings are interested in bicycle education. And a few of us have been digging on the internet trying to find a class that takes people on the road and shows them how to ride a bike in traffic. Right. And we came up with zero results in all of Portland. Like New York County. In Portland, specifically. Um, and others, a lot of other cities do have it. Well, let's There's talk about there. There are resources because there's a local terror, isn't there a local rep of the LCI, LCI the League of Cycling Instructors? Yeah, we're, we're meeting with them next okay. week, and we're trying to bring that here, but it's difficult for people to look up. I want to write, like the BTA, there are some groups, the Community Cycling Center, they have some in classroom sessions right. and maybe stuff for kids. There's a better movement for kids, safe routes to school, all that. Right. But for adults, we've got a lot of international students. They want to know right. how to bike in traffic. Well, how LCI has a multi-stage training program. Well, you'll do an in-class session, then you'll do like a weekend on a bike, and you'll actually be basically trained to be an instructor. Yeah, so I've been through that. Okay. I was actually so trained you to be an instructor. In, I could. Um, <laughs> I need to. Part of it's yeah. there's a, an expensive cost to become an instructor. I'm no longer certified. Okay. Um, and well, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on why there aren't more in Portland and elsewhere more bicycle education on the streets. I mean, I think it goes to this. There's just a lack of 
you know, the, the, the social importance of this is not that high. It isn't subsidized. I think if it, as it becomes more important, and if you go to places in the, on the planet where cycling is very important, those things are subsidized, they're free. I grew up, and some of you in the room as well, we grew up with compulsory bicycle education in the public schools. We had to bring our bikes to school. And we learned in a bike rodeo how to signal, look for traffic. How many of you did this in school? OK, so this was Maryland in the 1970s for me. So that's gone. That, that was a reflection of the oil shocks. Yeah. No, yeah, that's a good point. But well, let's talk after, and we can. This is not an easy problem to solve. I saw your hand, and then you. Yes. So Dylan Johnstone with um, Urban Planning. Um, so you talked a little bit about how in these meetings for like bicycle justice, that like they're scoffing at this idea of transportation justice. Are people getting the broader picture that it's not just um, that like these these issues of equity are you know connected to racial inequities and um, to income and you know economic like the sort of like those movements for justice like the racial um, the economic yeah. yes, immigration etc like right. all of those things are built into the way that we like look at the framework of transportation and that like ha being able to offer affordable housing and good transit options and livable wages is all going to depend on whether or not we can achieve these goals for transportation justice. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't want to talk about the bike movement as a whole monolith. In fact, the bike movement, um, I know in Portland, they showed up to a, an affordable housing hearing in, in Salem, in the capital. So they knew that housing was really important to their constituents. This was, um, someone probably knows about this in the room. By, so your agent, your, what is the Portland bike activist group? BTA. Had reps show up to this hearing on housing affordability in the state house, knowing that these are linked issues. And I thought that was great. I mean, not all bike activist groups are as disconnected as I'm, and I'm kind of painting the entire movement in this way. Not all are. And I think they recognize what you're saying. Some. OK. Yeah. Organization, the white board, white staff, white yeah. members. They're they're making strides for pedals. Um, they're not zero. I would say they're not zero. I know that I've seen one. The director wrote an op-ed about affordable housing in, in a newspaper recently that I read. I thought it was very good. So I think they're. Yeah. So, hey, ten years ago that would not have happened. So you know, it's baby steps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Jim Crow, mm -hmm. um, and Oregon has a mandatory bike lane law, among others. Yeah, they would. Now, how do you feel about removing laws like that that force bicycle segregation, force bicycles to use bad door zone bike lanes, and other inferior infrastructure? Yeah, I know. There's this whole squabble. So you're a you're a bi vehicle cyclist. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get into that debate. There is this lineage of debates within the bicycle movement around bicycles as vehicles, as being the safer alternative to dedicated bicycle infrastructure, which places a lot of conflict when that infrastructure hits the real world of the street network. And it has been shown to have those dangerous points. There is an alternative set of research that shows that people who are insecure do use that infrastructure, and those no rising numbers create safer systems for everyone else. And then those people kind of graduate to using the uh, rest of the infrastructure. I don't know if I'm painting this the right way, but um, yeah. And, and that movement categorized these segregated lanes and off street bicycle paths as segregated, separate but equal, or separate but une unequal in the Jim Crow fashion. I don't want to get into that. It's an interesting debate. It doesn't really hit at what I, but I think it, in a way for the bicycle justice community, I think it is an aspect of justice to have access to the street in a fair, uh, being treated fairly by other vehicles. I think that's what you're getting at. Well, you're um, forced to use, I mean, you want to use the street, but then 
things keep moving or you get forced to go right. around to the street that has a bike lane, even though it's the street's It's not as direct, right. 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 So there's that justice twist that I didn't want to get into. But it's important. Thanks for bringing it up. Now I can take one last question, I think. Yes? Uh, I like the slides where you overlay the cycling network with uh, the population mm -hmm. types in the city. But, you know, but the active transportation network is the result of a lot of confounding and, and uh, conflicting factors try to correct or anything like physical geography, transportation, commute pattern, or something like that? No, it was purely a level of service as measured by the preferred route by the cyclist. How direct was that? If it was indirect, then the, the neighborhood was relatively worse off. And if it was very direct, the neighborhood scored higher. Um, it's not, we don't look at actual use. Um, the topology of most of that, Phoenix, is very flat. So there weren't any topological issues to address. In San Francisco, that would be an issue. Clearly, there are paths of cyclists that go around the hills. Um, but no, it is not. Now, when I did the weighting by commuters, I did take the number of commuters from each census block who bicycle and then weight that to see if the, the population weighted average. And so that, in that case, it did show there was the synergy. But it's a good point. Yeah, it's a good point. And coding all of this on a network, as you know, is hard. We spent thousands of dollars of time on getting that co the, the network really accurate. We even had to code the crossings of every, how did someone cross the street? You need to add a link across the street if it wasn't signalized to show that a bicyclist may decide to cross a busy street without a signalized intersection. That was a big penalty, but it existed. So, so getting the GIS to work, we, we actually tried really hard. I can talk to you about that after. Thanks, everyone. I think it's noon. <laughs>